Hey, welcome to Tape to Tape, powered by the Ram 1500 Sport. Rory, we're going to bring Ian McIntyre on today to talk about the Canucks, mm -hmm. a team that we probably haven't spoken enough about that's off to a great start. Canada's best team. We're going to, if you read my weekend <laughs> takeaways, yes, they are in the red and white rankings. Mm -hmm. We're going to do some fake trades. Yippee, you're coming in with a blockbuster if uh, rumors can be believed around the newsroom. So I'm excited about that. I'm not good at these things. So we'll, we'll get there. We'll, we'll get, get there. there. Yeah. But before we get to either of those things, we want to talk about some other teams that are off to great starts uh, or getting their stuff together now. Teams that we probably haven't spent enough time talking about. I mean, the New York Islanders, 10 straight as we sit here and record this. They host the Penguins on Thursday night. What can you say about this team since Barry Trotz took over? What stat can you give me about this team since Barry Trotz took over that I may know you have teed up and ready to go? Yeah, so this one came from Reddit. And, I mean, it has to be seen and heard to be believed because it, it really is truly incredible. So we know Barry Trotz comes in and makes team's excellent on defense, and that helps the goalies and everything like it. They're a strong defensive team, <laughs> so they don't need a lot of goal power. But this stat, in games under Barry Trotz that the New York Islanders have scored at least three goals, they are 48-2-2. Two two. I mean, okay, if you score th three times in a game, you've probably got a winning record, and you're probably looking fine. But 48 wins 98 percent or whatever. Games, yeah, two of those losses in regulation... Um, I mean that's just absolutely incredible. They were they the way he transformed them from the worst defensive team to the best one last year. We've talked about that a lot, but there's been no depression from that this year. They're they're just as good. And now you're seeing, you know, last year was Robin Lehner. Now you're seeing Semyon Varlamov put up some from some stupendous numbers. Does he get into the Vesna conversation? And and should he? Like at at what well, point is they, it? Is it the goalie or well, is it the team? And right? they basically split it right down the middle, Absolutely. Bryce and Varlamov. Yeah. And, you know, they, they don't have the superstar names that a lot of these other teams have, but they have a system that everybody buys into. Obviously, it works, so it's easy to sell everybody on it. Um, and it, it just continues to be this amazing story. You know, the, the, the teams we talk about all the time in that division are obviously Washington and Pittsburgh yeah. for legitimate reasons. Carolina is the team on the rise because now they've found some goal scoring to go with the strong blue line. But we don't talk enough about the New York Islanders because we kind of thought last year, oh, it's going to catch up to them at some point. And then they get to the playoffs like, oh, now they're playing Pittsburgh. Here's where it ends. And they sweep aside the Pittsburgh Penguins. And then coming into this year, it's like, oh, you know, things are probably still going to catch up to this team. And, and they might be even better now. So it seems like Barry Trotz, and we should have known this and we did know it all along, we should have bought into this Islanders team maybe earlier, he just gets more out of his players and out of his teams generally than than maybe it looks like they should be able to I feel like do. it's more pronounced here than ever before. We always yeah. saw him, him as a great coach. Obviously, he did end up winning in Washington after he went through the disappointment there, just like Bruce Boudreau did, but yeah. went out on the high under that bizarre circumstance of us all knowing he, he almost certainly wasn't going to be coming back there yeah. at the end of the year. But... I mean, this is as black and white as I can remember with a coach coming in before and after in very, like, how far yeah. back do you want to go, you know? Yeah, I mean, maybe a team like Washington doesn't need Barry Trotz yes. as much. They, so they were succeeding let before, go, for whatever. sure. I mean, in a sense. maybe you're better if you have, you're probably better if you have them. No slight to their current coach. But a team like the Islanders needs Barry Trotz. A team like the expansion Nashville Predators needed Barry Trotz. And while they didn't win a lot in the playoffs with him and it took them some time to get there in a sustained way. He he got so much more of those teams than it looked like. I remember the name Sergei Krivokrasov popping up on Whoa. highlights and like th these were the kind of players that were playing under Barry Trotz at that time and yet he was always able to get more like they were making it to the playoffs earlier yeah. than anybody expected. They were giving teams runs for their money that when you thought they should be swept aside. So he really has a long history of of really overachieving with his teams. Uh, in Elliot Friedman's 31 Thoughts this week, somebody referred to the Coyotes as Islanders West. And yes. certainly what we saw last year under Rick Tockett, devastated with injury, but playing that tight, tight game, getting... Very good goaltending from yep. Darcy Kemper. Your boy. And, yeah, my boy <laughs> in fantasy. And they have really carried that over. Some of these guys who 
John Chaika showed a lot of faith on. Uh, signing early on, Nick yes. Schmoltz comes to mind last year. I mean, he came over from Chicago in a trade that at the you know at a certain point last year you were a little worried about if you were Arizona because Schmaltz was out. Dylan Strom seemed to really find himself in Chicago, but Schmaltz yes. has been great for them. Yep, they've got a lot of good things going on. Yeah, that's another team that's got a system going for it that that really works strong defense and the offense is better than it was last year i think clayton keller finished with the lowest points for a team leader and he didn't get to 50 no um and so that's coming around a little bit more this year schmaltz to your point 14 points in 15 games connor garland is a guy who, i mean i scooped him up on our fantasy i know league. uh i think a few people wanted him like he's a guy and uh, that's providing a little bit more offense i always remember him last year <laughs> There was a game where he scored two goals, and not one of them went off his stick. Um, <laughs> one hit him in the face, and one hit the back glass, and then the goal in Edmonton. Back in it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but you know, they they've got these these guys that are again they're overachieving, and then you've got a great defensive system and good goalies behind that. I, I wonder because Rant has done the same thing. Anti Rant has done the same thing. Like, is it the goalies are so good because they do have their own pass track records that are positive or is it the system and the team is just so good defensively? But I think we don't talk about them enough because in that Pacific division, there's a lot of good stories. And in Canada specifically, yeah. our focus is on Vancouver and Edmonton and what's going on there. And, and Calgary, I think we're still expecting them to come together a little bit more, but the, the heat is picking up uh, in in between Bill Peters' ears, you can see the smoke coming out of his ears and some of his post-game pressers right now, like the inconsistent efforts. And we'll get to a, them a little bit later on my fake trade. Oh, teaser. There you go. There you I go. Like um, and so because of that <laughs> um, and the struggles in San Jose and all this stuff, Arizona is somehow flying under the radar, yeah. but they are seriously a, a good team. They took a step last year. You know, the non-analytics or the anti-analytics, maybe people really take shots at, at this team. Like, oh, they have bought into this and it's not happening. It's going to take some time. And it does seem like the, it is starting to turn in a very positive way for them this year. They're getting some traction. And one team that caught its footing, I want to say just in time, maybe it would have been a little premature, but things were going sideways quick for the Dallas Stars, but they've yeah. won seven of eight. Yep. And this team that some people considered uh, an outside contender for the cup this year yep. is starting to show us why people did believe in it. And they've done it without Jamie Ben really performing very yeah. much. Like even in this eight game stretch, Ben has got I think three or four points or something. Like he's not doing anything. He's, he's certainly not the Jamie Ben who won the scoring title a couple of years ago. But Tyler Sagan is, is producing. My boy Rope Hints. I mean, he is really hitting this year. He looked really good at the end of last year. And you know, Joe Pavelski's kind of there, and he's he's coming around too. But it's it was also key that a young player like Denis Giryanov is finally seeming to be finding his footing six points in in this eight game stretch and there has been some inconsistency concerns with him and that's why he hasn't stuck in the NHL consistently yet but um, it looks like now he's found a home in the top six there. He was a first round pick, so he's got that pedigree yeah. to him. And it looks like maybe it just took him a little bit longer than some other guys in his draft class, but that he's finally hitting. And if that, if that is true, and this is a long-term thing now that he's going to be able to provide some secondary scoring, that was what this team sorely lacked last year. And that was why bringing in Matt Zuccarello at the deadline was so important for them. It changed their whole outlook, made them a team that was an overtime goal away from knocking off the St. Louis Blues in the second round and going to the conference final. Maybe they're the Stanley Cup champions if Jamie Benn's wraparound goes in. So now if they start from scratch with two lines of scoring and a team defense and goaltending that is continuing on from where it left off last year, this is why they were Stanley Cup contenders for a lot of teams. And, and it does seem like they're finally turning a corner. Maybe it took some time, some new faces, um, some, some new guys kind of moving up in the lineup. But at the same time, you know, we're going to see a little bit of a stretch here where they're going to be without John Klingberg. How do they deal with that? Their first kind of piece of, well, second piece of adversity after the slow start. Um, but they do seem to be coming together as that team that we should expect to be challenging for the Stanley Cup. They've been able to solve their own problems. We're going to solve some team's problems with some fake trades. Sure. We're going to put on our GM hats and have a little bit of fun in the next segment. Stick around for that. Fake trades. And later, Ian McIntyre joins us to talk Canucks. Stick around on Tape to Tape. Hey, if you're listening to this podcast, there's a very good chance that, like Rory and I, you are into fantasy sports. If that is the case, check out the Sportsnet 
fantasy pool presented by Ram. Go to sportsnet.ca forward slash Ram for a chance to win all kinds of amazing prizes, including a Ram 1500 Sport. Rory, last week or the week before I mentioned I made a trade, picked up Mackenzie Blackwood. Mm -hmm. So far, so good. There you go. Seems to be finding his way with the Devils as they get things straightened around. So I'm excited about that deal so far. I'm also very excited, as uh, regular TTT listeners would know, for a little round of fake trades. So I'm going to kick us off here. Okay. I got some small ones, but the last one I thought of okay. was pretty juicy. Okay. Just there's a lot of history to it. <laughs> so the first one I was thinking of, I mean, we're always talking about Carolina defensemen getting traded <laughs> because there's so many of them. Yes. Uh, the, they could still use some scoring. So I was looking around the league. Anthony Mantha, the rebuilding Ooh, Red yes. Wings. Uh, Great you, trade they just made, by the way. The Red Wings getting, getting, getting Robbie Fabry, Fabry with yes. some upside yeah. for Jacob Delarose, who probably floors NHL player, but fourth liner. Yep. So how about a Hayden Fleury for Anthony Mantha deal? The Canes get some potential for some real scoring down the lineup. Uh-huh. Fleury uh, doesn't look like he's going to be part of the long-term core there. I'm sure would like a chance to go somewhere and play a ton. Mm -hmm. He was a seventh overall pick. He's 23 yep. now. I think maybe there's a, a deal to be made there. That's interesting. I mean, I think it's pretty clear, right, that right now Mantha is the best player in that deal or at least has the higher ceiling. Yes, for sure. And would – I mean, do you think Mantha – becomes a 30 goal scorer consistently in the NHL. That's kind of what I've been wrestling with because I always thought that and it hasn't come so easily, I yeah. guess. I still think he gets there. I think he's a fabulous player, right? And bringing him into Carolina, they've already started to find that goal scoring. If you bring in a guy like him and he clicks with what they've got there, that could be a home run because you're not really sacrificing. I mean, Fleury is a great player in his own right, but you're so solid on that blue line. You're not really sacrificing a lot. But you're adding a huge piece to your blue, uh, your your forward. If unit. only for this year. If only for this year. Yeah. Um, the other one I was looking at. You know, the Boston Bruins are off to a roaring start. The top line is otherworldly, mm -hmm. but I feel like they could use a little depth in that forward core. David Krejci in and out of the lineup a bit. Mm -hmm. Maybe could use a big veteran C solidify things. Someone who's a long, not a long way, but certainly removed from his best days, but who is still a first-rate passer and could maybe use one last shot at a cup, who maybe has a little history in Boston. Big Joe. Big Joe. Oh, my God. Leaves the that. cratering San Jose Sharks. Got to wave that no move. Yep. And From moves... Boston to the middle of the Boston lineup. Maybe some nights he's the second line C. Maybe he's the third some nights. Mm -hmm. Helping out that second power play unit with those soft hands and that great vision. Danton Heinen going back the other way. <laughs> I mean, I just want that to happen. That would be a, that would be the most incredible trade. Could you imagine? I don't care what 13, other blockbuster might happen. Joe Thornton going back to 13 Boston. 13 years later. Wow. Got to believe the, the bad blood is gone. I'm so glad that you put that out into the universe. Huh? I hope it now takes hold. <laughs> well, what are you going to put out there, my friend? What have okay, you cooked so up? So this one comes off of, and I'm working on this for sportsnet.ca for Friday. Taylor Hall is doing his trip through Alberta, right? right? So you're talking about his pending free agency. If he's going to stay with the Devils, is he going to get traded before the deadline and all that stuff? And so my piece is looking at where potentially could Taylor Hall be playing next year with the thinking of he'll sign these places as a free agent. Because we've talked about it before, how when you really whittle it down, how it's many options are there out there that are going to have room for him, are going to fit his criteria and all yeah, that. Yeah, usually there's a team that has room, but maybe they're not a contender. That's right. Or they don't have room, but they're then how is it going to work out? So anyways, one of the landing spots I had for him as a free agent, potentially, was the Calgary Flames. Thinking, what if Calgary severely falls under expectations this year. Either they're out in the first playoffs or they miss the playoffs, whatever. And they decide they want to change things up. And so they move out Johnny Gaudreau to make Ooh. room for Taylor you Hall. Might whatever. You might have buried the lead there. And then, as I was talking this out, I have to give credit to one of our editors on the desk, Josh Benito, because I was talking this out with him. And 
he enlightened me with this amazing fake trade. What if, what if this is going wrong this season enough that Calgary says, we'll trade Johnny Gaudreau for Taylor Hall? <laughs> You'd have to have some idea that, or pretty much locked in, that you're signing Hall, yeah, I would think. Yeah, I don't. And that would be the key to that. And I, that's where I think it falls apart for me because I think Hall, by everything he said last year at the NHLPA golf tournament, really seems like a guy who's at least going to get to that window in June where he can talk with other teams. But how incredible would that be if you get him under contract, you have Taylor Hall in the Battle of Alberta against the team that drafted him, a line driver in his own right. Maybe you use him on the second line or you put him with Sean Monaghan right in Johnny Gaudreau's spot. Either way, that's going to be a game changer for the Calgary Flames. And going back the other way, um, New Jersey, rather than being faced with this decision on keeping a first line winger or not this year now you've got a guy who's under contract for a couple more years you can kick that decision down the road a local kid a jersey from boy. New jersey and you can still like you can keep this window open for two or three years of we're going to try and get to the playoffs we're going to try and keep adding to this we're going to surround nico hisher and jack hughes with a guy like gaudreau who can create a lot on his own maybe he's not as much of a line driver as taylor hall is but he's a very good skilled player Player and add that into New Jersey. I think that could be a big win on, on New Jersey side. You're keeping your window open to try and get into the playoffs. On Calgary side, man, you're adding one of the best players in the entire league that can do just about anything for you. And, and maybe he is what can fix your consistency or offensive issues on, on in the top six. Then. Yeah, my thing with from the Calgary perspective is I honestly think you want to add Taylor Hall to a group that includes Goudreau if you can swing it, right? Like that's yep. really when you'd be cooking with gas. And if yep. even if it meant giving up something tasty just to have him for this year, because as you noted, he probably does want to at least get to the, you know, the point where he rents out a conference room and has teams come through. Uh, I, I do think that's something you would think about if you're a Calgary, but I just think it would be a little bit of robbing Peter to pay Paul, sure. you know, put it this way. Paul's the better player though. Can we agree? Yeah, but he's also more oft injured and he's older. Like I, if I was New Jersey, I not would that do old though. I, he's not that old. 28 this month. He's 28 this month. He's not. He's not rickety, let's yep. be clear. If I was New Jersey, I would do that in a heartbeat. If I was Calgary, I would have some trepidation before pulling the trigger. Put it that we, way. I think you need to put your poppy back. Oh, on. <laughs> we <laughs> joked about it before that. <laughs> they fall off pin. a little too easily. There you go. Um, yeah, and, and again, just to tease the piece a little bit, it was coming from the thought that this is something they could do on July 1. Yeah. Thinking you do have some signings to do on the blue line. Nothing too huge, I don't think. Um, Michael Froelich is gone, so you don't have to worry about his four-plus million dollars. You would probably have to do something with Sam Bennett to move his two-plus million dollars out, and that's an easy decision if it means bringing in Taylor Hall. I, I wouldn't be surprised if Calgary's a player for Hall in the free agent market. Well, and Brad True Living has obviously been making very bold moves sure. summer after summer to try and push this team in. So if there is an even greater sense of frustration come next July, then you would have Look to out. think they'll be hotly pursuing him yep. and you know even if you get a player who seems kind of bent on going to free agency certainly wouldn't hurt to have him in your environment for four or five months to give him a sense of exactly yep. what things are all about there so yep. there you have it the first 2019 20 uh version of fake trades can we do one more? Oh, you got one more? I, you we did talk about the this fly? before the show uh producer drew's in the house he's a colorado oh, Avalanche okay fan. Hey, With Drew it? gets, he definitely leads tape to tape in <laughs> shout outs, which is directly linked to his bold uh, takes on all things Avs. So, so let's I want to put in on here. my fake trade okay. involving Colorado. And then let's put in Drew's fake trade involving Colorado. So my idea was not have not having an idea that he's going to sign in Colorado. So you're just getting him for the rest of the season. Would you trade Connor Timmons and Colorado's first round pick to New Jersey for Taylor Hall? Is that enough? Not under contract? I mean, Vegas traded Branstrom to Ottawa, yeah, knowing they had Stone under contract. So I don't think that's too far off. Or as Drew would say, not knowing Taylor Hall is going to be under contract, would you trade Bowen Byram to New Jersey for Taylor Hall? I think that's enough to get it done. It's a that's super high price, but it does open up the conversation, which I think is legitimate. Should you, when your window is open, just do whatever you can to keep it open? Because 
I mean, Drew used the example of Columbus last year making some big moves, but you could even look at Winnipeg as a team that was, you know, they were quiet for many, many years when people thought they should be getting aggressive. They did get aggressive trading a couple first round picks over the last two years for a second line center. But should they have been more aggressive more often? Because they're a great example of you never know when this window is going to slam shut on you. So I will take take up Drew's cause here. Here's a few right. things about Byram. Number one, he was found money. He was that pick from Ottawa that worked out wonderfully, and it's amazing yep. to have. And do you give away found money? Do you? <laughs> I, you know that's a good point. I'm not in the habit of giving away money in general, but I guess found money is a little easier to give away, and you're dealing from a position of strength because of Makar, because of Gerard. Mm-hmm. I do think, and I think the final thing is if I'm Colorado, even if in our conversations with the player and agent, you get the sense they're probably going to free agency. I think, you know, you probably can make as good a case as anyone. And you feel there's a, let's say 20% chance even that he would stay there. And then it really does make sense to throw him into that mix. Because if you got him, I mean, if you got him playing with Nazem Kadri on the second line, Amazing. and you got that top line going, and yeah. he's going to stick around for six years, now you're really, you know, you're really going somewhere. And I just yeah. don't think you're going to look back and say, no matter what Byron becomes, your sure. defense is still in good shape. And Colorado, if you have them, now you can sign them for eight years, and you, you're right. the only team that can do that. And they are one of the very, very few teams out there that you can label a playoff contender for many, many years into the future, it seems. It would seem. And like. who has the money to give Taylor Hall a, a competitive contract. You're right. Well, let's see if uh, what Ian thinks about when the Canucks are going to become cup contenders. Has that happened already under our very nose? <laughs> uh, they certainly look good coming out of the gate. We are going to speak with Sportsnet's Ian McIntyre, our man on the beat in Vancouver, about the surprising Canucks coming up right here on Tape to Tape. This segment brought to you by Subway. Subway now delivers. No joke. Welcome back to Tape to Tape. Time now for our Subway overtime segment. No joke. Subway now delivers. Joining us this week is Sportsnet's Canucks writer, Ian McIntyre. Ian, how are you? I'm doing very well. I hope you guys are well too. We are, we are. I know you're in Winnipeg waiting for uh, Vancouver to get there. We also know a lot has gone right with the Canucks this year. They have been uh, one of the early season surprises. I think that's fair to say. So we've heard a lot about Pedersen. We know JT Miller's been a great fit. We know the goalies have been good. What am I missing here? What else has gone right for Vancouver early on? Well, I think you're right that a lot of things have gone right. And even the things that have gone right have gone more right than what people thought. And you touched on on some of those issues. I I think the the biggest thing, the the biggest surprise, first of all, is the rate at which they're scoring goals. But everybody figured that with JT Miller and Michael Furland, who hasn't been as good, but with a better defense behind them, that the forwards would score more. So they're scoring more isn't a surprise. Uh, I would say the, the... biggest factors in in this start is that the six-man defensive unit from top to bottom which now features of course uh, Tyler Myers near the top Jordy Ben at the bottom and Quinn Hughes who's just been uh, uh, spectacular uh, as a raw fairly raw rookie the defense is a lot better than it was a year ago and that's helping that's helping at both ends of the ice and then a, a nice kind of bonus that has occurred here is a lot of the players who, who struggled last year, they have kind of risen with the tide here. Uh, as, as the talent level has gotten better and the results have gotten better, uh, a lot of players uh, who you would think maybe wouldn't even be part of the future, and I'm thinking in, in particular of third-line center Brandon Sutter, who was injured most of last year, Tim Schaller, uh, a fourth-line free agent signing from the previous year who was who just had an awful season last year. These guys have been really good, uh, really good. Uh, Jay Beagle is another guy who was here who's just been so much better this year than he was last year. He's another guy who had injury issues last year. So really, top to bottom, it's not it's not one thing. It, it's a whole lot of things. But that six-man defensive unit, 
has been a big, big factor. You touched on Quinn Hughes. Off air, we were calling him the one-man breakout. I mean, <laughs> this guy just seems born for today's NHL. What specifically have you seen from him through the first 14 games for him? Because he, he did miss a couple with injury. Well, everybody talks about how the, the really good young players come into the league now with such confidence. But um, some of the things that Quinn Hughes does with the puck uh, in tight spaces is just remarkable for a guy who's just turned 20. You know, his he just has this this confidence that he can, things that have worked for him are going to work at the NHL level as well. And, and so far they are. Everybody knew he was a fabulous skater and and his mobility is is obvious and I think everybody hoped and expected that he would be pretty good offensively and he has you know the first unit power play uh, basically was reinvented when Quinn Hughes finally went on and there was a lot of debate in Vancouver about why coach Travis Green was not putting Hughes on the first unit and sticking with Alex Edler but it's just been an entirely different uh, unit uh, with far more uh, puck movement and and dynamicism to it. I don't even know if that's a word, but we can make it one. <laughs> since since Quinn Hughes went on, the most surprising thing about him, though, the guy's five foot nine, 170 pounds. You obviously would think, okay, he's going to get overmatched at times defensively. This is the National Hockey League, and and they're not using him on the penalty kill in front of the net. But his his ability to defend using a couple of quick strides to close the gap and using a very, very good and active stick to knock pucks away from opponents or to, or to simply get to a puck first before his opponent can get there has, has been stunning. Nobody thought that he would have, I'm not going to say it's a 200 foot game, but that let, it might be 180 feet or 150 Mm -hmm. feet. Nobody thought he would be as competent, uh, more than competent, in fact, in his his own half of the ice as he has shown. And that's why, really, since since the uh, opening uh, week of the season, he's been a consistent, you know, 20, 21 minutes, sometimes 22 or 3-minute guy for the Canucks because uh, Travis Green doesn't really have to protect him that much. Plus the fact that he is part of that six-man group that is stronger and has Tyler Myers and Alex Edler as, as a, uh, I suppose, top pairing that plays against the other team's uh, best players, it it's, has helped uh, Quinn Hughes flourish. But, you know, in Vancouver, there's, there's this romantic idea that has existed uh, from the time that Elias Pettersson won the Calder Trophy last June that maybe... Quinn Hughes would would win the Calder Trophy next June, and it certainly seems possible the way he has started. You mentioned his dynamism, if we've just made a word or not. Dynamic. Yeah, let's lean into it if we're using it. Go for it. Um, I mean, it's just his rookie season, so we're not going to call him the best Canucks defenseman or anything outrageous like that, but when was the last time the team had a defenseman as dynamic as Quinn Hughes? Uh, never, never. Yeah, <laughs> we were wondering. Yeah, like, we could try to list some names, yeah. and like nothing's coming to mind, really. Mind you, it's only been fifty years, so maybe we're going <laughs> to wait for another fifty years to see. But no, I, I and and that's not hyperbole. It sounds like a stunning answer, but uh, honestly, it, it's it's the truth. I mean, I've I've covered the team uh, since ninety one, which you know, frighteningly, is coming up on three decades for me covering <laughs> the team. The two decades before that, I was a little kid in the 1970s. But I do remember the Canucks, and I was a teenager uh, in the 1980s and followed the team very closely. They've never had a defenseman with this skill set. They've had some really good defensemen, you know, uh, Ed Jovanovsky and, and Matthias Oland, and even Alex Edler is up at the top of a lot of uh, career lists for Canuck defensemen. But they have not had a guy with the skill set of Quinn Hughes. The nearest I could think is if you if you go back to the late 80s, the Canucks had Paul Reinhardt right at the end of his career, and he was an offensive defenseman. They had in their um, President's Trophy years almost a decade ago now, they, they had Christian Ehrhoff, who was, who was a dynamic defenseman 
and and got some points for them and ran the power play, but was just a shadow of what Quinn Hughes is already. And Hughes is just 20 years old. Uh, this guy is only 5'9", but he is going to be a giant in this league, I think. So Dan Murphy has been doing a mailbag every other week on Sportsnet.ca. I wanted to ask you a question that was presented to him this week, and it was about J.T. Miller, who the Canucks gave up a first-round pick for to Tampa Bay, either this year or next. Because he's fit in so well, producing and is doing just tremendously alongside Elias Pettersson, do you think already that that trade has been worth it? I think uh, I think it's it becomes definitively worth it if if the team makes the playoffs and they do, it doesn't have to be this year uh, it could be next year because they do have one year of of lottery protection in that first rounder that they're sending to Tampa or have sent to Tampa. J T Miller has been you know just fantastic. He's been if you were listing and keeping in mind this has been a terrific first. Uh, month for the Canucks so even in that context if you were listing their best players uh, JT Miller's probably well for sure he's in the top five and then it's just a debate of how high he wouldn't be number one uh, but he could be number two but he'd certainly be in the top five so he's he has been that good for them but when you're talking about a lottery pick you don't know what that pick is going to turn into so if the Canucks miss the playoffs both years and the Tampa Bay Lightning win the lottery. It's hard to say that, yeah, it was worth giving up uh, a first overall pick or maybe even a fifth overall pick for JT Miller. But if they make the playoffs so that, so that, you know, the pick is mid first round, well, most teams would be elated if they drafted a guy in the mid first round who is doing what JT Miller is doing right now. Of course, Miller's already 26. So he's halfway through his career, but he's got some good years ahead of him. He's got a very manageable contract for the Canucks. And right now it looks like an, an excellent pickup for them. Well, as long as Vancouver's lottery luck continues, they don't have to worry yeah. about it. Right? As long as they can transfer <laughs> yes. out to Tampa, they're yes. okay. Exactly. Except with Vancouver's lottery luck, it would be the team with Vancouver's <laughs> pick who actually wins it. The Canucks, the Canucks would never win the lottery holding their pick but if somebody <laughs> else has their pick it suddenly could turn into gold that's well, the way, at least that's the way we think on the west coast they have certainly had no trouble finding gold in the first round uh luck or no luck brock besser quinn hughes i think was number seven but we've got to dive into Pedersen here the fifth overall pick from 2017 i mean when you said the things that have gone good have been even better than people expected is that how you would describe his play because expectations were sky high even before last year he lived up to them already seems to be exceeding them again to the point that i'll leave you with this we did a top 50 ranking of the players before this season and we talked about the guys who could make huge leaps when we do it again next september and he was a guy we basically said the sky was the limit we could be talking about him as maybe a top five player by the end of this year or next year yeah, uh, I would I would agree with that, and I think he has the potential to be the best player the franchise has ever had. Uh, it you know you can debate probably Pavel Bury. I mean he's in the Hall of Fame. He had some great years in Vancouver. Um, they did have Alex McGillney for a sixty goal season, one of the years that McGillney was actually trying. So <laughs> uh, they they've had some good players here, but um, Pedersen just from from a skill and creativity perspective is is off the charts but uh, as we've seen he combines that with an incredible work ethic and just like you know Sidney Crosby uh, was the best player in the world for a long time may still be I mean that's a that's a good debate these days about who is the best player but half of Crosby was always how hard he worked every shift just relentless relentless on the puck relentless without the puck well, there's a lot of that in Elias Pettersson, even though he's, you know, six foot three and about a buck seventy. Uh, he competes hard, uh, and you know he doesn't try and square up the players and take them on physically one and one. But he he does not mind the battle, and his his uh, two hundred foot game is is way better than 
what people thought it, it would be. And I think part of the reason, like if you'd said that he would have, um, what is it, 20 points to this point, uh, you'd have said, yeah, that's that's possible. He's a really skilled player. But if you think about uh, how hard the points were for him to come by at the in the second half of last season, particularly down the stretch, uh, I, I think it's almost worth more right now because what he is showing is not only that he's a, a great player, which we kind of thought from last year, but he's showing already that he whatever whatever that that uh, speed bump was it was a pretty big speed bump that he ran into in the second half of last season. He's now soared past that and and moved on, and he's now at another level again this year from where he was last year. And so whatever his his points end up being, that in itself, the fact that he's going to have a is a better player now than he was last year is is already uh, an incredibly positive thing for the Canucks because you when you come in and you have such a high bar at the start the question is always okay is how much more do you have well he has more he has more and what he's shown so far is already pretty special so we'll get you out of here on this last question we just want to get a temperature check on the fan base in Vancouver because we know that when the team is struggling and losing a lot the fan base can have some reactions <laughs> yeah. so what's yeah. it like when they're winning yeah, well, if anyone's old enough to remember the old anti-drug commercials where this is your brain and this is your <laughs> your brain on drugs with the egg sizzling yeah. in a pan, that's pretty much the Canucks on any two-game losing streak and the fan base. <laughs> but uh, people people are excited, and and you know what they they have been excited uh, probably since Brock Besser uh, arrived and scored a goal in his first game, and then certainly. They've been excited uh, once they laid eyes on Elias Pettersson at the NHL level uh, last fall, and and that excitement now has been turbocharged by the fact the team's actually winning. Like people, uh, I think people hoped that the team would win and knew that with the young players they've got, we haven't even mentioned you know Bull Horvat. Mm-hmm. With the young players they've got, there was a good possibility that that a lot better days were ahead. But I'm not sure too many people, other than general manager Jim Benning and and the hockey operations staff, not many people thought that that would be happening already this fall. You know, most people, I think, even optimistically, were hoping that the Canucks might, you know, start well enough to be in the fight, just be be in the discussion, and then just try to hang in the playoff race until April and then see where they end up. Well, right now... I mean, we're still so early, but right now they're they're probably 20% ahead, maybe 25% ahead of of where even optimistic people thought they would be. So, yeah, people are excited, and uh, they always they always stand to be disappointed, <laughs> but they've endured they've endured a lot, Canuck fans, the last four years, and certainly are enjoying uh, the moment in the sun right now, and just hoping that that sun stays out for a while yet. Well, certainly the Canucks have uh, done a lot to to buoy their spirits, and we'll see if they can follow through. Ian, thanks so much for joining us today. You're welcome. It's nice being on with you. Call me anytime. Anytime, anytime. All right, we'll be happy to have you back. That is Ian McIntyre of Sportsnet. Just as he was talking, Rory, I was thinking, like, do we not draw the obvious line between (laughs) – I love the Toronto-Vancouver connections – I mean, they they really do have that feel, though, of the Matthews, Marner, Nylander, Leafs, just in that how quickly things went from bleak or seemingly bleak to, wow, there's just not something here. There might be something really here. Yeah, different timelines, though, right? Like Vancouver didn't completely nuke their roster the way the Maple Leafs right. did. They've kept different approach. Edler and Tanev. And that was always part of the discussion. Um, you know, there was a certain section of fans, people that thought... And people on this podcast who would have been, were, were pounding the fist saying, why aren't you getting rid of every guy tanker. you can? Yeah, you're a big tank guy. Um, you know, trade away Edler or Tanev and those guys. Burn it to the ground, get whatever you can. Um, and my, my thinking was always, well, you still need guys like that when you come out the other end to play minutes and 
I, either they help you get out of it quicker or they just help you ease in the young players and you're not forcing 20 plus minutes on guys that just aren't ready for it yet. And so that has helped them, I think, get it. Like Vancouver is not doing this. If Elias Pettersson is, is this amazing, Vancouver is still not doing what they're doing right now. If they traded away Edler and Tanev a few years ago, you probably didn't make the trade for JT Miller this past summer if, if you absolutely burned everything to the ground so i think by doing i mean it's a rebuild but it's not a complete tear down so it's a more of a retool maybe by doing that approach taking that approach it maybe gets you better in line to come out of it a little bit faster toronto i mean when you add austin matthews and mitch marner at the same time right away it was a little more natural and i think the path for them was a little bit more open in the eastern conference than it could be in the western um and that's why they made the playoffs in that first year. exactly for sure so little different timelines but to your point i mean yeah you you add you you add in elias petterson you get more than you thought you were getting out of brock besser as a goal scorer when you drafted him towards the end of the first round I mean, that accelerates you no matter what team you are. Well, certainly an exciting team to be watching. We will be keeping an eye on throughout the year. That is it for this episode of Tape to Tape. Thanks again to Ian for joining us. Thanks to you, the listener, for indulging our fake trades. We'll be back (laughs) with more than before too, too long. If you want to follow Rory on Twitter, and you should, at Rory Boylan, check out everything he's doing at sportsnet.ca. Myself, Dixon on Sports, and come back next week for more glass rattling hockey action on Tape to Tape.